So welcome to Allegories of Infrastructure. I'm Toby Altman. Um, really glad to have all of you here. The theme from this panel is really very loose. Uh, all of us are thinking about infrastructures of various kinds, digital infrastructures of capitalism, physical infrastructures of universities and institutions and hospitals. Um, so we're hoping that our readings will kind of bounce off of each other in interesting and productive ways. Um, we'll each read for like 12 to 15 minutes and then hopefully we'll have like 10 Oh, we're all going to introduce ourselves just kind of informally. Uh, so I'm Toby Altman. Uh, I teach at Beloit College in Wisconsin. Um, and I'm going to be reading from a new book that's coming out from Mindy Subway this year called Discipline Park. Um, it's a book about uh, Prentice Women's Hospital in Chicago, which is where I was born. Um, it's also kind of like a weirdo architectural monument of uh, brutalism. It's like, it's like a Soviet spaceship landed in downtown Chicago for like 30 years. Um, and the university where I went to graduate school, uh, which is like a very neoliberal kind of institution, Northwestern, is like, fucking hate this place. It's everything. It reminds people that other organizations of social life are possible, um, so we have to destroy it, right? Um, so while I was a graduate student at Northwestern, they demolished this building. Um, and that seemed to me like a really interesting kind of uh, situation to be in, like depending on the food, money, and rent money, while it's also kind of actively engaged in um, like damaging your historical relation to a place. Um, so I wrote this book about it. Um, and I'll, I'll read it a couple of books. I have an iPhone, and the battery is not what it used to be. I buy smooth, broad hummus for dipping and snap snacking. I eat a pizza called Smack Your Spinach. I am sitting at the tyrant's table, and the tyrant says, you won't find an ATM trekking through a canyon, but you will almost anywhere else. OK, but can I use your bathroom? Uh, under the pressure of the camera, he becomes a white knife, an agony, a propensity to be injured, even as he urges the wound. Is this creature in agony? How should I know? The tool suffers the same fate as the master. Each season ends with a spectacular corpse, the tyrant whose body cannot be counted, an untimely fig shaken from the branch. The tyrant says, politics is an organized sense of dread. No, exercise after 30 is an organized sense of dread. No, the self is dread by other means. Usually, the world is a weapon. Isn't the weapon wonderful? Alone in the creamy wilderness of the hotel, I become water in agony, a mobile home with its walls unwelded. As if to stabilize myself, to dress the puncture in medicinal plastic, I focus on the shard filmed with delectation. I taste the perishing feast. Outside, wild muck burdens every bough. A swan is hunting the banks of the drainage ditch. Grime reaper, she rides a loaf of fertilizer foam. There is a blank between her flesh and eyes, the kind that likes to be fructified. As it happens, I was thinking like a corporation that winter. I bent the slow, objective lens to stimulate my appetite for debt. Thus. The hiatus in my flesh expanded according to a cancerous logic. My hands asked for the suturing harp. They returned to my lap, empty. Let's skip this one. All right, I wanted to read this one for Kelly because it's like very infrastructural, very material. <laughs> Concrete starts life as a messy soup of suspended dust grits and slumpy aggregate. It ends as rubble, the point of wreckage that enjams the river. It rots from the inside. Its weakness is its reinforcement, the stiff rebar that helps it stand. Its authors thought it would never decay. They thought they had designed permanence itself, beyond which there is only winter, a U-Haul roosting at the far end of the hospital. 
It is frail skin sculpted to mold. It is a pocket where property goes. Who knows what happens inside it? Probably language in its liquid form. The point is to see the body, Simone says. Can you see my body yet? How about now? I want my body to happen to me the way concrete is poured in a wooden form and hardens there, taking the texture of the wood simply because that's how it makes itself, how it happens to act. All forms of deliberate motion can be very beautiful. Simone taught me that. One body is a sculpture. Two bodies are a landscape. Three bodies are a building. After that, you're on your own. So as I was working on this project, I got really interested in Bertrand Goldberg, who's the architect who designed present Prentice Women's Hospital. He's probably the most famous for um, the Marina City Towers in Chicago. If you're a Wilco fan, they're like the Going Pop Towers on the cover of that Wilco album. Um, he's a really weird figure, like kind of really different from the famous architects of today. Like he, most of his buildings are in Chicago, um, and uh, he wasn't like jetting around the world building like fancy buildings for dictators or something like that. Uh, he was educated at the Bauhaus in the 1930s and fled Germany when the Nazis came to power. Um, and I think he like kind of remained committed to the ideals of the Bauhaus through his career, like the idea that avant-garde art could make the lives of ordinary people better. Um, and I think that's kind of a sad thing to believe in the 20th century. Like I, I think that was kind of a tragic belief for him to hold. Um, like he he had this ambition to make these buildings that would become complete social systems in and of themselves. Uh, and there just like wasn't money or appetite for building things at the scale of his ambitions. Um, so anyway, I got really interested in him and, and kind of traveled around to see all of his buildings um, and wrote kind of poems in their presence and in response to them. Uh, and I'll just read three of those poems to close out my, my set. Um, so this one is Elgin State Hospital in Elgin, Illinois, which was uh, designed between 1965 and 1967. One. In my dream, I see a young white man with a swastika tattooed in the tender flesh of his neck, smoking next to a concrete mixer. Prince of Blackwater, what fracked pastures are in his pockets? Why does the daylight embrace him? His soldiers fire biodegradable rounds into the soft flank of the burial mound. What you see is what you get, the world like a fractured lens. Two, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt, for you traveled easy as the dollar through subdivisions the color of dehydrated rose, for you walked into the Fox River fully clothed, as though offering yourself for surgery, river fed by highway brine and mercury. And the river refused to open for you, for you became your father, naked and bloody, in front of the camera, performing the murders of your, murder of your ancestors. For they refused to enter the room. To be a Jew in the 21st century is to be refused. For the world you love is like a clouded iris, for you built this world and your children rent it. Three, I walked long blocks of brick bungalows and I found myself at the headquarters of the highway patrol. I saw the suburb as though from the high cab of a police cruiser. I thought, I wish America was someone else's problem. The building is, as I feared, abandoned, a discarded place. In the hall, someone has dumped a steel rat trap, long loops of black tube, a pile of shattered glass, as if to say, nothing here will be renewed. I take a picture of a winky face, Gatorade blue, slapped at a jaunty angle on the window. I hide under the arch when the rain comes. Information, admission, security. Somehow the lawn remains plump, November green, ravaged by the rain. Bertrand wanted to build a flexible city, compact, adaptable, contained in circular walls. He wanted to endow a space with nourishing, to leave a smear of honey on the counter at the bodega. One always expects, Mendes de Rocha writes, architecture to deliver extraordinary buildings, which, however, change nothing whatsoever. St. Joseph's Hospital, Tacoma, Washington, 1969-74.
They are called, as if he built music, the Goldberg Variations. Six hospitals that fold and shiver, plastic curves painted white to give them volume and gloss. Six hospitals and one is missing. Pictures do not show how sensuous they are, how the folds fold on each other as you walk around them, a body in the presence of a body. Pictures do not say how his buildings take the weather, smudged at the cornice, a ridge of shattered glass to keep the pigeons off. Built on a high hill in Tacoma, St. Joseph stands like a flock of birds on narrow legs. It threatens to lift into another world, a juicy place that Nixon cannot reach. Say that you want this world, and it is yours. It hides inside of money. It is the low moan that currency makes against the world. It is the thought that makes your camera drunk. This building exalts the act of looking. It teaches you to see another world in the folds of this one. A headache makes your mouth plunge, then it pulls away. The smell of diesel or the smell of rain. Now you are a thick suburb under the pressure of a credit card. Your body is a box of mirrors, a mercury mine. You have blossomed and spread white mystery of spring. All your blood and treasure is spent. Oh, Rose, you are sick. The morning rain does not nourish you. Your mouth is caught in a rigid O, where only deficit is at home. You stand beneath a white hospital, almost drunk. You cannot say why your sense is drenched. Exhaustion or death? What's the difference again? A braid of eyes, curtains the color of a dove's wing. Ceramic lips framed against seismic shatter. Soft zone. Meanwhile, your uncle is dying in San Francisco and you do not know it. You are standing in front of another hospital whose patients are strangers. You unwind a rope of carbon so that you can post pictures of it on the internet. How much damage does your life do and how can you refuse? Oh, Rose, you are sick. Only injury sustains you. River City 2, Chicago, Illinois, 1983 to 86. Crisp squares of concrete, the brain in a bath of glass. It fills with the smell of fennel, like cold water or a kiss. I'm standing in the kitchen, and obviously it's raining. Blue swoon of the branches, twilight like a low throat. Meanwhile, she rubs a hole in her delicates. Tedious thatching, a place of spores and spokes. How pleasure makes fluid derelict to produce through light alone. To manage anxiety by provoking it in small doses. To feel anything? No. To feel what? A rose instead of rose. Act so there is no use in the center. Act so there is no use in a rose. Keep up the heavy fabric of the sentence. Say the names of flowering shrubs. Write as though you were holding up a bag or bottle. The tired arm of language. The exhaustion of the thing it describes. Nothing is lost on you. Nothing lets you be lost. Thank you.
Um, uh, there's a bike shop near my house that has a vending machine out front, and in the vending machine there are bike parts and cook bars and first aid kits and things like that. And I asked the owner if I could put a booklet inside, and he said sure. And so he sent me the dimensions of like what would properly fit inside the slot of the vending machine, and I tasked myself with making this tiny book. Um, and then trying to think of what I could put, like what would be most appropriate to put in the vending machine on the sidewalk, I had been writing these stories, kind of during the pandemic, about a person, a, a woman, uh, laughing and laughing and laughing on the sidewalk and going on these kind of walks and observing these like infrastructural like things going on in her neighborhood, like gas lines, water lines, lots of bricks, concrete, concrete barriers, and construction. And so I put a bunch of those, a bunch of them, four, I put four of them as could fit in this tiny book to put in the vending machine um, for sale. And so there's only ten of them. Um, I have liberated three from the vending machine that I have here with me today, so they're you know, a rare object. Um, but it's called Infrastructural. Um, so thank you for reading that concrete poem uh, on my behalf, because I was reading like texts about um, you know, concrete manufacturing history of, and like technical uh, manuals with regards to how my concrete barriers are constructed thusly. There's like particular angles um, and water runoff and things like that. So I'll read um, three and a half of these. I suppose, and that should be it. Cool, good, questions, concerns? No, okay. So the first one, there's a piece in here called um, by XYZ, which refers to the three um, coordinates on a coordinate plane, and I will just read Y, so by which is this one. Uh, by Y. <laughs> the infrastructure will change how I project a diagram of the city's gas line, which had to be flared at the end of my street, loud and hot. Under me is the line, I mean the pipe. By project a diagram, I mean I'm trying to map my surroundings, and lately the city's been digging up sidewalks I'm on, so I cross and then cross back. By project, I mean picturing an elongated body, mine, as if I'm outside it, to observe my own discipline, how I'm all angles and aggregate not yet dug up. Invention. On this street, tree roots push up planes of sidewalk, prettily or not. I'm not. I'm not part of this. Prettily, I walk along it, footsteps mirroring the concrete's dimensional shifts. Under a low branch marked with reflective tape, my mistake, what I'm walking through, trails behind me like a cat. If I think something up, make it, make something up, while I'm out here, I'll count it. It'll count for something, the squares I'm not counting, cracks I don't even care about or walk carefully over, I just keep going. I duck under unpruned branches, which is what I need, a good pruning. Or an alternative is I blame this, him, I blame everything on my fondness for invention. This is drooping. Freaking me out. Toby, thank you for your assistance. This one is called a parametric study of sound mirrors. And this, maybe you know about this fact. Do you know a sound mirror? A sound mirror, is anyone? No? No? or an acoustic mirror is, <laughs> um, it's like uh, in the coastal England in like World War I, there were these like big concrete structures that looked kind of like a hollowed out or like inverted sphere. Um, and it looked like, oh yes, incredible. Look, the tiniest book of the universe. I mean, anyway, it looks like, like a big hollowed out sphere and it was on put on coastal regions because it could easily pick up sound um, from incoming ships and stuff and little like like old microphones where you like put your ear up to it and like the way that this, the like spherical shape can kind of hollow out and project sound like an early form of acoustics. You might experience this in like museums sometimes you have those like archways where you can like go on one side and talk to your friend who's like way on the other side. It's like that. So. I was um, looking up, I was, a friend of mine was telling me about sound mirrors, and I thought, oh, that looks like a concrete barrier. Um, it doesn't, but I decided to make it one. So this is called a parametric study of sound mirrors. 
The sidewalk is underwater. We did this. I hear it. The next day it dries up easy. I walk and listen. I know my love is insensitive, distant. Along the sidewalk I'm walking, I hear no more water. It's dry here and will get drier. Each day I'm out, leaves browning. The old brick houses are brightly painted. I come across a set of concrete barriers, a hole in the road, equipment, but no one's around but me. This mess is meant to facilitate resurfacing. The barriers are triangular when I look at their ends. They slope to the asphalt and are crooked in their road blocking the road. I approach like they're deer. One, making the mirror. I decide to move them. I'm an operator, an agent for my own sentences. There are six, so the arrangement is this. One in the center, two flared out on either side, then the other three on top, one on another. I'm strong enough to move them, which seems impossible, but I do it. I move them with my arms, and I press my hip against the edge of one, bending low and pushing from there the strongest part of me. It slides like it's on jelly. The apparatus consists of me shouting, listen, I'm just trying to get this right. When drunk, I'm handsy. If I'm constrained, I radiate sound waves in a coherent beam. Two, siren. My eyes are two equally spaced concentric holes. The vertical reveal at the base of the barrier is intended to provide a neat line. I line the barriers up in an arc and shout into it. Echo. I mentally cut a curved reveal on the concrete surface and shout into it. The sound out, this person I manifest for myself. Barrier slope banks the vehicle, which may yaw, pitch, or roll over. A motorist's head could go through a side window and make contact. Not with this kind of warning, the sound that I'm holding. A verb, which takes no compliment, such as rain, has zero valence. And then this is the last one, the first one of the book, the last one I'll read. And it's called Discovery. And this borrows some language from um, Thomas S. Kuhn's uh, Structures of Scientific Revolutions, which we've all read and are familiar with, but the, the gist is that uh, like revolution and scientific discovery doesn't happen like at once, it's always because of like repetition and, and cycles of behavior and thinking. Um, so this is called discovery. Discovery is not a single act. I must drastically restrict the range of admissible evidence. A yucca pokes through the snow, as do some rocks out and onto the sidewalk or over it, the yucca spines over it, the sidewalk, which is sandstone. The streets blocked off for drilling. A car makes a Y turn. I'm on the sidewalk, I walk carefully around the yucca. I'm on the sidewalk to walk carefully before drilling while it's quiet. I walk an immeasurable distance. On this block, a car turned completely over, a stylish man has a beautiful dog. Someone tells us the driver inside keeps changing the radio stations. They're trying to talk her out. How did it get like that, we wonder together and then split off. The city's drilling up this street so I can't go down it. A car rolls through a stop sign so I go behind it. Turning left to turn a corner, turned over, I look around a brick juncture, flush sandstone slabs and some trash, turn briefly around and then continue on. I cross the street. I follow a pursuit curve toward a semi as it pulls in front of a warehouse, and when it stops, I'm able to cut it off, walk right up to the grill and look into it, steamy and hissing, and the driver looks down at me curiously, so I'm caught. I give a little wave and walk back the way I came. I cross someone's yard. The truck symbolizes a big feeling, I reason. 
my path toward it in the snow my measure. I thought I had discovered something, but so does everyone. Okay, I'm looking for someone. He won't let me find him. Each car has a possible outcome. I get in it, get hit by it, let my hand slide over a taillight. In the window, his face, a stranger's face, slush splashes up onto my legs. He's in the concrete, the steel, the glass. What counts? I can't ask what I want to. It's safe for me to remain abstract, an answer, a kind of owning. The neighborhood's construction unsettles the totally known. It will reset. That's not discovery, then. Just a prediction based on fact. What they'll uncover is already marked by flags and spray paint. I know this block. I'll settle for precision, a refined prediction, some arrow, so not much will have to be dug up. Does that remove him entirely? I've limited any evidence too narrowly. The range, the length of my walk, curved breadth. All that's left, a flicker of light, something glinting off an aluminum sign, or there was never anything to see. A man whistles at me from a car. I shout, fuck you. He shouts, please. The man with the dog rounds the corner. He nods and crosses. We're walking in circles. I look at markings on the sidewalk. The shadow of a yucca cuts through. The sandstone's divots could be from any time, prehistory or whenever it was placed here or this week, from weather or violence. I walk around brighter asphalt. It's loud. This, I want to see that it is and what it is. Construction, ground, car, him. A suddenly offended vehicle materializing on the corner I was just on. Yeah, thank you. Bedlam. 
psychiatric hospital for evincing signs of madness and paranoia. It was during Matthew's forced residence at Bedlam that he developed a complex conspiracy theory that involved an heirloom, an influencing machine that Matthew's claim controlled his every thoughts and actions. Matthews was descriptive about the machine and provided detailed drafts and illustrations that demonstrated how the machine worked. Sketches that John Haslam, the chief apothecary at Bedlam, pu published in a book that Haslam intended to rest his fame and expertise on as a medical practitioner. I found Matthews' heirloom to evoke the black box model, albeit providing extremely detailed illustrations and descriptions of the machine itself. But that the machine was never actually discovered and that its spectral existence became the basis of clinical and psychoanalytic accounts of Matthew's schizophrenia is precisely why the machine was a black box. Matthew's attempt to describe the interior functions of the influencing machine might be construed as an early form of black box syndrome, what is otherwise called paranoid schizophrenia or a severe persecution complex, which Victor Taus in his article on the influencing machine characterizes as involving, quote, feelings of inner change accompanied by projection of the inner occurrence to the outer world and belief in an originator produced by the paranoid mechanism, end quote. Magnetic rays go in, paranoia and conspiracy come out. But the black box remains hidden and occluded and its phantasmatic agents and some subcontractors lurk in a dense underground of speculation. We see this in contemporary accounts of conspiracy theory from JFK's assassination to the recent capital insurrection prompted by white supremacist fantasy narratives nurtured by QAnon. What Richard Hofstadter called the paranoid style of the United Statesian politics finds its analog, its mental equipment in the current media ecology predicated on actual black boxes, that is, the innumerable colonies of servers and concentric surveillance networks that disassemble and reconstruct notions of identity from user interfaces and spectatorial feedback loops. The echo chamber of social media presents other subtler influencing machines that acquire salience in the repetition and virality of tropes, memes, and signals. There is a technical definition as well as a financial definition for black box syndrome. On the, in the Oxford Dictionary of Finance and Banking, I quote, it's, it's defined as a general term for the problems that may arise in using complex mathematical and statistical models in finance. For example, it may be difficult to model transparently the impacts of trading on the overall exposure of a complicated set of positions, end quote. According to the Heuristics website, I quote, they define as the, the major cause of interface black box syndrome is business as usual, which happens when you leave it to your subcontractors or consultants to manage the environment you are accountable for, end quote. On the surface, these are unpoetical statements, but looked at closely, they are deeply poetical. After all, the cause of so much malignancy in the world is, in fact, business as usual. An uncritical attitude toward life that delegates critical functions of political and moral agency to diverse forms of automation and the algorithmization of extremely online lifestyles. Whether it is business as usual or corporate makeover, the dictates of the market remain the same, expenditure and profit at the expense of communal deviation. In the financial sector, the black box syndrome is the opposite of chaos. It is the lateral substitution of an inadequate automatism for a better one. A volatile environment is micromanaged with the view of subduing and abolishing any presentiment of chaotic form. Speech is regularized into code, and the black box's terrible magicum is systematized from the outside. A century or a few nanoseconds of syndromes momentarily averted. Theodore Adorno writes, in the all-encompassing system, conversation turns into ventriloquism. This refers to what Adorno had noted as the transformation of speech into a socially prepared mechanism that disarticulates or disenchants the originary power of language into a perverse or reverse magicalization. 
Um, and here's a quote from Minima Moralia, who I don't know. As a, mean, as a pure means of power, however, the disenchanted word exerts a magical power over those who use it. It can be observed time and again how something once uttered, no matter how absurd, accidental, or incorrect, precisely because it was once said, tyrannizes the speaker like a possession they cannot break away from. Words, numbers, and meanings, once concocted and expressed, become independent and bring all manner of calamity to those in their vicinity. They form, and this is what I really like, this is what I, from the quote that I'm borrowing, they form a zone of paranoid infection, and it requires the maximum reason to break their baleful spell, end quote. In appropriating black box syndrome from its financial context and redefining as a breakdown, approximating to the disenchantment of language, I suggest that the financialization of everyday life, the algorithms hold on futures trading, for example, resembles a kind of chaos magic in which the automation of language and its alchemization into the unheralded silence of program code crafts a zone of paranoid infection. In other words, financialization works in the manner of an anti-chaotic, prescriptive, predictive civilization of language, a form of black magic that proscribes and restricts rather than unloosens or liberates the voice body. Um, okay, so I'm just going to read the last uh, paragraph. The following series of poems follow a formal logic derived from the shape and weight of the hexagrams of the book of changes. However, the poems were not composed according to the traditional method of divination, as practiced by the users and consultants of the I Ching, nor are the poems intent to mimic or correlate to acts of metagnomy. There are poems that build upon a more recent secular tradition which began with the Surrealists and was extended by poets like John Cage and Jackson Macklow. In other words, there are chance operations that refute or disavow the malignant chaos magic of financial markets and instead embrace the Chaos Mon, theorized by Edouard Glissant. Neither fusion nor confusion. Such a cosmovision marks an ability to endure in disorder. Against totality, against the finality of systems, the hexagram affords a plenitude, paradoxically, in the infinite nutshell of its constriction. So I'm going to cut it short there. I'm going to read just six of the pieces. So. Um, the, the poems are, are short because they're hexagramic. They're six lines, and they basically follow the 64 hexagram. So, you know, when the book comes out, it's going to have a very hexagramic look to it. Um, all right, so I'm going to read th uh, six of the pieces from that work. This is uh, numbered, they're all numbered. 13. The Nahuatl hides its arms in thick grass under various moons of inquest. Under various moons of inquest, a brother animal breathes in the machine vapor and asks that the blood of a running brook offer to spill its red black over stones broken by light and the red east, they say, the belated one, marry her, who opened the box. My tonali returns me to him and he is me in the undercurrent. Narratives of miscreancy are common where the yoke of the sun splatters. 14. They're in love with narrative and large wagons, custom built for largess. The poem is a machine. The poem is a machine which should make sense. The poem is a machine which should make sense. It should make sense and carry loads, loads. The black box is a machine which should contaminate the air with feeling. A dementia like the aroma of miklan and the gushing of pomegranate seed. Our wrapped faces in the screen time and nature the eagle's gourds washed heart. He wondered of the wandering tribes who still speak inside this orientation. 15. The telephone erects semblances in the way our shared mind lifts. The telephone erects semblances in the way our shared mind lifts paranoias. 
paranoias for an excess of sight, across mute channels of speech. Across mute channels of speech, he is caught off guard. He is caught off guard when the call comes out of a vacuum in the corner of the grotto, and the sense of day or night is blurred in bell song while the voice asks him to illustrate the levers and buttons, the levers and buttons, which the imagination conjures to ward off the not, not knowing. 16. A theogony of music might appear irrelevant to what words manifest in the shape of eclipses, as stark as the black dog, as stark as the black dog, the spears make their displeasure known. The spears make their displeasure known in silver metal machine music. An ohm in double triangle unlocks. An ohm in double triangle unlocks. Witsilopochtli's wewet. The mallet strikes several ghost notes. The mallet strikes several notes. The mallet strikes several ghosts on an ocelot spine, yet he lives without dying. He lives without dying, his dark mind devoted to harmony. 17. The purple sun extinguishes on the remains of a cane toad. The remains of a cane toad. The consulting firm instructs us to ingest it. Ingest it during company retreats. During company retreats, a crisis of management might be offset by opioids of fact-checking. Opioids of fact-checking. Object permanence quakes. Object permanence quakes. Their eyelids blink in sedition. What is an individual? What is an individual? What is an individual under the lens of closed-circuit telepathy? or the adherence of red poppy seeds smooth like saliva on skin. Red poppy seeds smooth like saliva on skin. And this is the last one. The supply chain is an allegory for the ways the black box breaks down our collective fantasies concerning the borderlands. Concerning the borderlands, and its intangible affects, there is no here, and there is no there. There is no here, and there is no there. There are no states which are united in us or in the language we speak. There is no identity crisis other than the dark core of HMM. Algeciras, ambling blindly along the mystic canals of Panama in search of interval. Wanting it to another, 
where she asked if I'd be interested in translating one of her books um, that's not a book of poetry, but something slightly odd. Um, it's right here, <laughs> um, holding up our mic. Um, it's in Korean title, it's Anan um, Iroke Maheta, and I've translated that as The Spoken. I'll tell you why I translated that way soon, but uh, what happened was uh, Kim Hyesun in 2014 was um, anonymously blogging for about eight months through a major Korean publisher's internet blog. And no one knew who was blogging, but these uh, strange writings were coming out uh, every week. And during those eight months, people were wondering who this was, this kind of a uh, kaleidoscopic picture of Korean contemporary uh, society as well as a world of literature was coming out uh, through these pieces of writing. And later in 2016, when the book was finally pu published for the first time, uh, it was revealed that it was Kim Hyesun and everyone was like, this is like a literary hidden singer. And if you guys have seen that show, you'll know what I mean by that. Um, so, uh, so the volume's pieces are uh, originally from that anonymous blog and they're like poems, they're like prose poems, opinion editorials, vignettes. Uh, Kim Hyesun joking, half jokingly calls them folk prose or poetry prose, um, saying that they're neither poetry or prose. Um, poetry reaches higher than this, and prose reaches into deeper places. Um, they explore lives of Korean women, daydreams of a creative writing professor, the metaphysics of poetry, and much more. Um, but the selection I will read today are surrounding these uh, locations and buildings where literary production happened one way or another. And by literary, I have a very open meaning for it, and you will understand what I mean. Uh, they also focus on the legacy of struggle for democratization in South Korea, the revolutions in 1970s and 80s against the military dictatorships of that time. And you'll hear Kim and kind of through this complicated relationship between her as a women writer and a writer of modernist verse, um, and modernism in Korea meaning poetry concerned more with language and technique than direct social action. At least that would be the criticism of it. Um, and the previous generation of these uh, revolutionaries were now in positions of power um, and within the infrastructure of the literary world in South Korea. Um, so for the project, uh, the poet also invented a persona named Anna. Um, Anna is a uh, adjunctive adverb of negation in Korean, so it means it's a particle that you throw into a sentence and it negates the entire sentence. Um, I decided to translate it as an apostrophe T, the contraction, and I've been pronouncing it as unt. And the title itself, Anna that is a, a pun, a parody of the Thus Spoke Zarthustra, so Thus Spoke Unt. Uh, and Boots' adventures all take place in this country called Ero, uh, and it's spelled A-E-R-O-K. Spell it backwards and you'll know what the word place is. Ero Fiction Factory. There once was a country where beings produced works of fiction. The tools needed for producing such fictions were clubs, screaming, and bathtubs. There are various methods of completing a work of fiction, like feeding, hanging, and pushing someone's face into water. When the writer's progress on their fiction slowed down, the screaming of friends, relatives, parents, and spouses were brought into the adjoining room, and this pushed the peak of the fiction's climax higher. The employees of Fiction Factory only need to repeat this one order, confess, confess, confess. The encouragements for Creating fictions did not stop until it was possible to say, I didn't do it or I did it. Adult Fiction Factory was a booming business. After fiction writing was over, fiction writers were cast out. To some seashore or to some mountain valley, it's such a secret that not even the sewer rats knew what happened. Or they were thrown into solitary cells for decades. And the only way to reduce their sentence was by raising the level of shock in their fiction. Fiction writer H came home from the fiction factory and their body was the color of ink, and they suffered aphasia for months. After H's passed by, 
such fictions that no one would ever want to read again were completed as the writers crawled. However, we come from those fiction factories. We were born there. Some time ago, right before one of those fiction factories could be renovated into an art museum, I went down to, the, to its third basement floor, and there were fiction writers who had become ghosts, unable to leave the haunted hallways, and their mumblings would not cease. Their minds utterly lost in the writing of their fictions. After ages passed by, when the daily record keeper of Edok's tortures was elected mayor, Edok's order came down that now, instead of beatings, carrots would be hung around everyone's neck. Revolutionary's new job. It must be hard for a revolutionary to get a job after a revolution. <laughs> Can being a revolutionary be a job? <laughs> Among ex-revolutionaries of Edel, specifically literature majors, three job categories are most noticeable. The first being those who became national assembly person. The second being those who became poets who write love poems. The third being those who became tourists. Of course, there are also social activists, farmers, mental patients, publishers, professors, teachers, still somehow writers, real estate models, still somehow revolutionaries, and so on and so forth, many who have managed to get new careers, and many who are keeping true to the revolutionary struggle in their daily lives and jobs, and many who have passed away. But the ex-revolutionaries who are most noticeable to us now belong to the three aforementioned categories. And in those categories, there are those who work as all three, or just two, but rarely just one. Among them, the ones who write love poems write such poems with religious connotations, but they are never sensual nor pornographic. They despise and call grotesque the pornographic poets and the young poets who howl about failures. From the perspective of Unt, this is because they still see poetry as a tool for the revolution of romantic enlightenment. The types who became tourists like to take photos as well, but they don't go to Africa, Europe, or North America. They only go to places in Asia. The themes of their travels are about healing, reconciliation, and mutual understanding. The usual sentiment behind their lenses is nostalgia. They console themselves with landscapes they think are less civilized. To prove that revolutionaries are human beings after all, Lin thinks that these people should get a better second job by starting pornographic scandals or going to camera-restricted areas in New York, London, and or Tokyo and try to put their lenses on folks there and get their asses beat. This isn't something someone who enjoys the benefits of their revolution should say or think, but Unt hates how the ex-revolutionaries find a poor country and take photos of people there who are beyond humble that they don't even try to show any self-consciousness. Somehow, the ex-revolutionaries must miss our country's past. And this one is about a, a very difficult experience of trying to be a judge for a literary award. <laughs> and this is the longer one, and I think that it, the time allows for it to be more piece after this. Choice. There is a building at the symbolic center of Edo. What happened, happened in a corner room of this building. A meeting for the selection of a poetry award winner was being held there. This was the third meeting, and we were to pick the winner that day. There are many criteria that can be used to categorize the five judges. Gender, four males, one female. Drama, three poets, one critic. Adult style criteria, two realists, two modernists, one ambiguous. The criteria for these categories is automatically applied to anyone who is over the age of 50, but not so for anyone below 50, or sometimes it is not even considered. Worldview, aesthetic rationality, traditional lyricism, everyday editor, womenhood, modernism. These are categories used by journalists. Job, one retired professor, three active professors, one editor at a publishing house. Majors, two adult literature-related majors, three foreign literature-related majors. Hair, four black hairs, one white hair. 
People of Arab are born with black hair, so it does not work as a category for them. This is the same for eye colors. There are only various shades from brown to black, so we do not categorize human beings according to the colors of their eyes. In ancient texts, they said that the women with darker eyes are more beautiful, but now women of Arab sometimes wear colored eye lenses because they do not like their dark eyes. Political alignments. One man categorized as leftist, one man categorized as right wing, three men and women who have never been categorized as either. Marital status. All five are married. Marital status is also not important. 90% of anyone above age 50 in adult are married, no question. Incarceration status. One person who went to prison, three people who may or may not have gone to jail, one person who has never been to jail. Prison experience is important. If he has been to prison, then it is proof that he is a practitioner of realist literature who lived through the dictatorships of 1970s and 80s. It tells us that he prefers the opposition party that is not in power and that he is a leftist. The fact of his incarceration is an important barometer, proving to us that his poetry is in tr transition from poems about resistance to poems about love, traveling, regression, glorification of motherhood, infatuation with Buddhism, etc. Shoes, three black, two brown. Jacket, one checker pattern, one black, one gray, one brown. Drink, two coffees, two green teas, one water. Glasses, three wearing, two non wearing. Reading glasses during the selection process, five wearing. Residential location is all. Four kaku, one kanina. According to journalists, the book of poetry can be categorized by using the following criteria traditional lyric, rural, resistance, philosophy, abstraction, ambiguous, not even the journalists have kept, tried to categorize them, travel, popular, living things, natural love, veteran, rhetoric. The five judges had met twice in the previous month and had narrowed down the list of ten books to four. The remaining four books were as follows. Traditional lyric, rural, philosophy, resistance. One of them had to be chosen to that day as the winner. Opinions were shared. Unt talked and wrote things down. About traditional lyric, it has received too many awards recently. It is not as good as it used to be. It is copying the entertainment of gentlemen scholars of chosen dynasty. It is copying the attitudes of a carefully, carefully lifestyles of literary men of the past. It loves wandering and drinking and women without any interiority nor social criticism nor incisive commentary nor wit. It loves its blank spaces. It writes like do food. It is kind of disappointing. <laughs> About rural. It acts like a child. It cannot be translated into a foreign language. It is a beautiful painting of a landscape. It is a childlike everyday life of an adult farmer. How can someone with a job as a professor write these naive scenes of farm laborers? It is the epitome of purity. It is purity that is camouflaged with barriers. About philosophy, what does this even say? I have been reading poetry for decades, but I don't know. If I don't know, who can know? Let's say this is translated. Who will understand this? Who were the preliminary, preliminary judges? Their tastes are questionable. It is good that there are parts we can say we don't know. It is philosophy of every day. It is philosophy of the quotidian. It is the omission of the mundane specificity. It is perhaps the extrication of the external, the extraction of it. It is a deep interrogation of time and being. It is a link in the chain of the struggle to blow out the self. It is similar to the work of Octavia Potts. It is highly recommended. Give an interpretation of this work if you can. An interpretation, your interpretation is, uh, an interpretation is given using one of the poems as an example. Isn't that interpretation more like poetry than the work it purports to interpret? About resistance. Revolution was given up, and the poet went to stay at temples instead. Disappointing. <laughs> the work reflects on one's own failures, while also having the power to strike directly with the message. Where is revolution and resistance? Where are the reflections and remorse about that? This isn't prosaic. This is just prose. It does not point toward the externality of life within the interiority of life. It only despair despairs about the externality that will always exist. That is why it is prose. 
He came out from the actual prison and now struggles within the prison of time. Buddhism, dance, meditating to be a bodhisattva, these are all escapisms. Why do all the failed revolutionaries of era go all the way to temples? They don't just go to temples, they go to women too. Isn't the path of such a life beautiful? Doesn't it feel like these are some marks fornicating with a serpent girl after reading this? Five laps, 42 silences. Discussion didn't lead to any agreement, so we decided to vote by narrowing the list down to final two. We each wrote names of two people on scraps of paper so that we could keep a record of them. Two votes for traditional lyric, two votes for philosophy, three votes for rural, three votes for resistance. We decided to discuss only rural and resistance, each of which got three votes, but it took a long time. During this process, one of the judges gave up their vote shouting, I don't like this kind of democracy, and proclaimed that they wouldn't participate in the next vote. They argued in favor of philosophy until the end. And so, resistance received three votes in the final round and was selected as the winner. The poet who was also an editor who argued for rural until the end without saying goodbye left. Thank you. <laughs> We have about 10 minutes for questions, discussions, comments. The floor is open. Compliments. Compliments, yes. Critiques. Uh, I'll start us off with a question. One thing I was thinking about during these panels is the kind of like the etymology of the word infrastructure and the way that it describes something which is both perfectly visible and completely hidden or invisible, like a, it's structural, but it's also infra or, um, and I think that kind of tracks with the kind of the of these readings, which sort of blend the boundary between what can be seen and what cannot be seen, right? Like the, the writing, Kim Hyson's writing on the blog can be seen, but who the author is cannot be seen, or um, the, the behavior of a paranoid person can be seen, but the interior of the black box can cannot be seen. Um, so, I don't know, maybe that sparks something for some of you, or, or you want to talk about the kind of, like the way that the work is negotiating the border between what is evident and what is hidden, or uh, what is visible and what is invisible. Or not. Can I put a fine point in front Yeah. Do you think that now um, that, uh, that, you know, since more things are, are visible or, or can be examined uh, because of you know, information systems or search engines and now with AI, yeah. that there might be this um, drift towards one to reach toward these, uh, these unseen mm -hmm. liminalities and so the things are sort of becoming spectrographic mm -hmm. in a certain way. Uh, so not, not, only, not only in terms of, of referencing things, mm -hmm. but, uh, but actual sensitivity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I think so. I, I, I think I was thinking about this in relation to notion of interiority. Uh, which is constantly, at least my take on it, is that there's this, you know, when we talk about decoloniality and, and things like that, and decolonization, it, often it's interiority that's at stake, right? Because it has to be externalized, marketed, has to be packaged, has to be produced in a way that makes it communicable, right? I actually think about the judges, the discord of the judges, that something can be just rule, right? That that describes the whole you know, a whole, you know, gathering of things, right? And and I think that for me at least, um, in dealing with the infrastructural or the, the invisible, um, there has to be a kind of an ethic involved where interiority um, is made weirder or stranger. I think we're talking about chat GPT, right? I'm gonna use chat GPT since so that's been uh, in, <laughs> in, in a lot of conversations. ChatGPT is really good because it shows you how banal writing has gotten, right? It's just, it's just so infinitely banal. Like, it, 
you know, as an instructor, as a professor, as a teacher of English and composition, um, I'm always trying to get my students to say something really fucking weird, like really different, right? To be very contrapuntal. And it's really hard to just teach that alone, right? We've been so long trying to teach them to just write coherence, like really boring versions of coherence. And I think that the infrastructural or the invisible could be a way of rethinking what actually is coherence, right? How can our interiority sort of define that kind of colonial project of trying to externalize all our thoughts in a way that AI can understand, right? Uh, you know, that would be my favorite, if that makes sense. I was just thinking about what prompted me to like read the like history of the shape of the concrete barrier. <laughs> I can't remember, but it was I sent it to you. It was fascinating, and I think because um, it was like readily available, like this object and this thing that um, I was like, why is it shaped that way? How it, it explains why and how it was shaped that way with like particular angles of cars and all the different like when when a car would ramp up on it, like the odds of what type of shape of what type of vehicle and what speed would like flip over and roll versus like being gently like laid back down into the road is why they're shaped in a particular way and like how water runs off and things like that. And so I think that like availability of information that I would never get before has been um, exciting and interesting to me, I guess, in terms of making them invisible visible. Um, but at the same time, um, recently there was, a, not like, like four years ago, there was like this, all this activity out at the end of my street and they're, sure enough, the, they were flaring, they flare the gas line at the end of my street, which meant like shooting a flame like way, way up into the sky like to the electrical lines. And my husband and friend and I ran and we got beer and we got, and then we ran out to the street and we're just like asking all the um, people what the hell is going on. And so they explained like, well like apparently this like giant gas line that fuels like a bunch of Denver runs right in front of my house. No idea. And it's like this bit is a huge, huge pile of fuel like right in, like where I park my Prius and atop it. <laughs> and it's kind of like an alternative, I guess, like way of gathering information that I think we don't do as much anymore to speaking of like the banal of, of chat GPT of like running up just tapping the shoulder of a man flaring the gas line. Um, <laughs> I'm getting lots of information that way. Um, that, that, that's, a, that's another <laughs> interesting angle yeah. about, about infrastructure. It's yeah. becoming more, well down here, um, you know, we're, we're, we're prone to, to the complete destruction of our infrastructure. Right, right. Not through, through natural means, but through just, uh, you know, neoliberal decay and, yeah, yeah. and, and negligence and, 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 and things of these. The roads are this great. Sort. I was tripping all over the place. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and so maybe maybe that also is that kind of raising of consciousness mm -hmm. of infrastructure. You know, among among friends down here, I, I sort of always label myself as a, as a sewer socialist. <laughs> uh, so say, you know, that, that first this, this attention to infrastructure, you know, whether it's you know material or or you know legislative or political zoning or whatever. You know, there has to be a sort of a mind put to that. So, so maybe, maybe in some way there's a scale between like hyper visibility would be like on one end, and then the other one is this, this thing that you're talking about too. It's like it's a complete absolute, even something like even invisible seems so kind of visible in that part. Mm -hmm. Like from that involved you invisible. There was all, like in the '90s, there was all this invisible this and invisible that. It's like it was like invisible committees. <laughs> but anyway, it's just loose thoughts. But I feel like a lot of this is kind of like the, the what was it like mushroom eyes or something like that, where like you see a mushroom and then like suddenly they all appear to you everywhere. Ah. You know what I mean? And like I think like Toby and I did a we went on a brick tour recently in Chicago. Have you been on the brick tour? Uh, There's a brick tour that you can take. Just a brick. Oh, yeah, we'll go <laughs> but like once you look, once your eyes and you start seeing these, like you'll see these fucking everywhere now and start thinking about the different angles. <laughs> Take up. Um, I don't know. I like drink drank the Kool Aid of the concrete. <laughs> I, I actually call it the Prius effect because when I yeah. got a Prius, I just start seeing Priuses everywhere. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we'll talk about them too. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Other questions? Thanks for comments. I'm trying to turn my comments into a question. You can just comment. Well, I was just I'm thinking about um, 
sort of uh, run with like what Rodrigo was talking about, we are talking about like the way the three that I saw, I'm sorry, I missed your group for Toby, but um, I kept thinking about like rupture, and that's what, always what I'm interested in when I'm thinking about infrastructure is like infrastructure becomes so visible when there is a little piece of rupture, rupture. and so um, like the, the gas flare happens, and you're like, fuck, those gas lines right there, like it's crazy. Um, and thinking about like interiority being ruptured is like, the paranoia, but like when the paranoia becomes visible, like in people's actions. Um, and then I was also thinking about Jack, like uh, how translation in, in a way is like a rupture of language, how we're um, becoming more visible, or something like that. Um, well, yeah, the, the, the hospital that Toby was the born in that prompted maybe part of this project was torn down. Right. 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 Like, so, yeah. 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 There's something so exciting, too, about rupture. Like, I was thinking about that. Like, like there's something. Um, I think these little elements being made visible, or like the previous effect of the mushroom effect. Um, I've been thinking about paint colors a lot lately. I'm working on this house, and um, I realized I was like thinking about these blues, and I realized that, like every single blue of the uh, when you drive around the city, uh, like 50% or more of the houses in the um, in the awnings in the front uh, have blue paint, and it's like this thing that was like one of the things like keep the keep like spirits out. And to me, there's like there was like a rupture in like the surface of colors that like tuned in my eye or something like that. Yeah. And there's just always like an opening to that. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when I go see tomorrow. Like, um, when I got you know my house, it's like all the, the ceilings were blown, and, and I asked them, all the why all the cute spirits that I just told you about. Matter of fact, I'm all like, oh, good to know. Yeah. Yeah. Told me it was the strangest. Pigeons. Pigeons. Both pigeons and spirits. Uh, yeah. I did have one very specific question though, Jose Luis, when you were saying you're always trying to get your students to like do something. I was thinking about like you were trying to get them to like rupture that like uh, the finality, and I was just curious like how you do it. <laughs> it's a lot more boring than you think. <laughs> do you have time? <laughs> I just I try to get them to think contrapuntally, which is to say like always think of what's the establishment uh, opinion, mainstream opinion, consensus view, and then write against that. So it's, it's it, it, in academia, they train us to think that way when we're doing, breaking new ground and making claims. Um, so I'm just bringing that to them, right, um, at, at undergrads, uh, at the undergraduate level, about how to think about, especially with close reading, how much, um, how much uh, uh, intuitive thinking can you get out of one line of a poem? Because they, they tend to think about holistically about what this whole poem means. Yeah. And I trash that meaning you know, like everything you can get is in this one line and it will be randomly picked. So I also use chance operations in class. It's always uh, free. And they're surprised by the weird stuff they come up with. Yeah. So. We'll have to call it there. Thank you all so much for coming.